is Jennifer Rondeau. Uh, she's a technical writer at Stripe, and Jennifer um, is a Write the Docs organizer and community lead, Kubernetes Docs lead emerita, and project maintainer. And I'm so sorry that I started introducing Scott. He's later in the program, and uh, I scrolled too far. So uh, with that, Jennifer, um, I don't want to take any more time from you, so I'm going to leave the screen and uh, and let you share with us. Well, no worries. Now I know there's a session I don't want to miss later on. <laughs> um, so I do not seem to be... Sorry, we've got one more little technical glitch here because I am not sure how to share my presentation. So if somebody can guide me through that. Hi, uh, Jennifer, at the top of the screen where your image is, uh, you should see, um, no, I'm sorry, at the bottom of your screen, there is a, uh, a little uh, uh, icon of a screen between. Uh, it. Got it, got it, um, icon challenged. Um, I've already confessed on Twitter that I'm generally image challenged, so y'all know not to expect memes from me. <laughs> do you do you see the button? I uh, do, and ah, uh, it's going to ask me to share the entire screen. So I apologize, folks. I have this queued up. Um, I have this queued up um, the way it's queued up because I want to demo on tabs, which means you're seeing my whole ginormous screen. Does that look like it's a problem, Mark? Because I can change the way I do this. It's it's really small right now. So okay. Uh, okay. no, 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 no. I know what to do. I, I chatted about this with folks beforehand. Okay, um, thank you. Um, it's gonna get a little bit interesting here. So just how's that? I think we should be good at this point. Um, and I will improvise when I get to the point where I do a demo. It's great. So first of all, um, if you came expecting to hear how to do Stripe Docs magic, that's not exactly this talk. Um, I will talk some about the Stripe Docs, but the my topic is really at a what you might want to call a higher level of abstraction. Um, there's a whole range of issues around audiences, plural, not singular, um, for API documentation that I want to address in the next really not very many minutes. And that's not a, I mean, 20 minutes isn't a lot, period, to talk about any of this stuff. Um, but first, a little bit about me. Um, I am one of those folks who not infrequently winds up in software. I'm an academic refugee. Um, who spent some of her classroom and research years in academe playing around with the early web. And that's kind of how I got into software when it became time for academe and me to part ways. Um, so I came to software with a background in research and you know, kind of a habit of compulsive curiosity. Um, but for a long time, it was mostly a paycheck. Um, I needed to feed my kids and keep a roof over our heads. Um, but along the way, I spent a year um, helping document the Xbox SDK, and the APIs were really pretty fascinating. And when I started um, at Symantec, low these many years ago, um, after a few years, we developed an API project that sort of showed me how I might take my interest in web development and code, which I really wasn't ready to turn to full time, um, and combine it with my interest in documentation to become something more than just a pay paycheck collector. In other words, API documentation really became something I wanted to make part of what I was increasingly calling a career, uh, not just a way of earning a living. Um, and I've been, well, in Washington, D.C., where I live, for example, I show up at the local web APIs meetup when we have them in person um, and turn into that redhead in the back of the room who kept raising her hands and saying, OK, you're generating your documentation. That's all very well and good. But who's writing the strings for those description fields? So 
this is this is what I do is I make noise about API docs. And today I really want to talk about who we are writing for. That we need to write for them is um, we all agree. Um, APIs need docs. In a way, you can call, and for a number of years, people have been pointing this out, you can call API docs the GUI for the API. Uh, because without information about how to use the API, you cannot write an integration. Um, but when we come to think, when we talk about the audience for API documentation, um, we tend all too often to lump it into this one big glob we call developers. Um, the, the tendency is to distinguish developers as a single audience from end users, kind of an unfortunate term, but that's not the point here either, um, who are those lesser creatures who need GUIs to help them get things done. Um, but for developers, we know what they need. They want lots of sample code. They don't need very many words. They just need to be shown how to do a thing, um, you know, sort of get in and get out, but explain it, you know, while we're at it. Um, turns out that's, as I've already set this up to explain, that's right, but it's not right. Not only is it insufficient, um, it turns out that there are non-engineering roles paying a lot of attention to your docs um, if your product is an API. And it's important to pay attention to all of these audiences. It's not easy to do. And it's not something anybody, including Stripe, gets right all the time. It's something that we need to keep paying attention to and keep adjusting for and keep thinking about. It's process. It's not um, a sort of an end result. So I'm not giving you answers to how to address multiple audiences here. What Instead, what I'm trying to do is give you ways of thinking about addressing different audiences, multiple audiences, audiences that seem to be asking for conflicting things in the same docs. Well, it's our job as API designers and documentarians to figure out answers to these questions. And we have to keep fiddling with those answers. Point of clarification here, I'm talking about public APIs. Um, but some, and some of what I talk about um, is unique to the challenges of public APIs. Um, but if you have a microservice architecture under the hood, or if you've got a commitment to internal API governance, some of this is applicable there too. Your internal API consumers need documentation too, and not just descriptions of parameters, um, right? There's, there's a lot of, there's, there can be a lot of slippage um, with internal APIs as well as externally facing ones. And while my focus is on those external APIs, I hope that if you're listening with an interest primarily in um, internal APIs, that some of what I have to say is useful there also. Um, so, you know, we have more than just a single category of developers. We've got different levels of skill and experience and responsibility even. Um, often, you know, a, a product that is just, you know, sort of get, working to get to market quickly has a relatively small team, but has in fact divvied, divvied up um, engineering responsibilities will assign someone who, you know, is still finding their way um, to actually implement an integration. Um, technical founders can be in a huge hurry. They don't have time to understand all of the nuance of your API. Um, just give them code that works and let them move on to the rest of what they're trying to do because it isn't all about your API. It's about a whole lot of other things besides that, right? When you move beyond um, the world of startups or small companies, um, which are historically, um, especially Stripe's core market, um, for example, um, roles beyond engineering often play um, a significant part um, in your audience. Um, managed service providers, not so much a thing anymore, but spoiler alert, we're gonna be talking about them a little bit in just a minute. Um, 
are a very specific form of audience that might want to integrate with your API. Product managers want to know what the overall design of the product they're trying to ship to market is going to look like with an integration of your API in play. Um, one, um, increasingly, Stripe is dealing with non-technical founders, people who have a bright idea for a service to provide on the web. This is especially true in, 20, in 2020, right, when business is moving online really fast. Non-technical founders who need to know how to do things without code with your API. Yes, that's a thing, really. Um, CTOs of larger companies um, who need to worry about um, the complexity of the integration, who need to understand some of the technical detail, but also need to understand things at a higher level. All of these roles are potential um, and more, right? This is not exhaustive. These are the roles that this is a really sort of crude summary of the roles that I've encountered in writing for different audiences. Um, your mileage may vary. You may well find um, that your user base has other, other sorts of roles. Um, consuming your docs, writing integrations, or just trying to understand what's involved um, with, um, with putting together an integration, right? It's all part of, um, it's all part of the, the story of who's your audience. So to talk about all of these audiences, what I wanna do is tell three stories. Um, stories about APIs that I helped document um, at three different points in my career. Um, and I will make a few more disclaimers about the first two um, as I tell those stories. Um, Semantic and Capital One, those stories as I tell them are clearly not current. Um, but what's interesting about those two stories as opposed to Stripe is both of them were new APIs or sets of APIs. Um, so I was kind of in at the beginning of the project, and that turns out to make a big difference in terms of how you think about audience and what you're going to provide to them, both in your API and in your docs, because ultimately we can't decouple these entirely, right? Um, but the issues themselves, I think, are kind of evergreen. Um, even if they are in the details specific to those projects, um, they also offer up uh, questions that I think are useful to keep asking as we try to figure out who we're writing our docs for. So um, at Symantec, I'm, my academic career was as a historian. I tend to go in chronological order for things. So to begin at the beginning of my career in API documentation, um, at, at Symantec, um, I wrote docs for a GUI-based management console for security software, um, enterprise security software. And um, the, the console went on, you know, sort of the, it's a client server architecture. And for years, it, you know, bumbled along quite nicely doing the job it needed to, um, occupying a fairly stable market. <clears throat> But at a certain point, um, Semantic became aware that a couple of interesting things were happening. First of all, remember this is back in 2011, 2012. Um, managed service providers were coming on the scene and wanting to offer a range of services to their customers. Um, so Semantic's manage, um, security management was a piece of the story they wanted to tell. They were trying to integrate with a bunch of different APIs. Um, Semantic didn't have an API um, for this management server. And so that seemed like a market that was useful to explore. At the same time, um, to support on the server side, we needed to, um, this is a side bit, but you need to understand it a little bit. We also realized that outside the, man the MSP market, um, a fair number of um, server customers were customizing their client management by hacking on, this is a Windows only environment, uh, by hacking on the Windows event log and the registry. And they were hacking against reg keys that did not in fact do what they thought they did. So we had a major usability problem there and the project was twofold. Um, both build the APIs on the server side and rewrite the client um, to be, um, 
more supportable for the kind of customization that other, other customers were, were trying to do. The two things went hand in hand, but it was the API side of things that got interesting with regard to the audience question. Um, so um, we did a lot of user research before we launched, uh, before the APIs were even designed. Um, there was such a commitment to user research that even I, as the assigned technical writer, was flown out to customer sites to interview customers to understand what they needed and how we should proceed with both design and documentation. That's kind of amazing, right? Um, I mean, writers are involved with user research at Stripe, but not at that level of, of company investment. It was, it was a pretty cool thing. Um, and we thought initially that these APIs were not gonna be just for this target market, that we were gonna be able to extend into a larger market. Um, we were fuzzier about that. So we really, really focused on the needs of these MSPs. Um, we, and as a result, you know, we have the result that you see on screen. Um, we wrote detailed integration docs, detailed reference docs. And it turned out that we needed to provide a lot of custom support. Um, the design and the docs did a pretty good job of helping integrations happen with the single exception. And those of you who've been here will recognize this. Um, auth was a big stumbling block. Um, because we're talking about security, um, we made the decision to implement um, the authorization code flow in OAuth um, for this on-premises um, server. And oh my goodness, that was a world of hurt that we never successfully addressed in the docs um, or in any of the UI that we provided um, to our customers. Um, instead, we simply provided um, custom support. Um, it turns out we didn't know our audience quite as well as we thought we did. Um, now, our response to the situation was not to actually revise very much because we realized that, in fact, the extensibility of that API was not as great as we originally thought. It's okay to basically unship a thing, um, but this project did, in fact, help us figure out how to move forward with the design. <laughs> okay, <laughs> confession, that was a set of SOAP APIs. Um, and while that was not in context a questionable decision, um, it made a difference when it came time to figure out how to move forward and move toward rest. But the design work that we had done and the docs work that we had done um, for this initial project helped us think about how to um, effectively sort of redesign the server monolith um, to build internal REST services. Um, that's a different story I don't have time for. And as I'm telling it, I'm realizing it's actually more interesting than I realized when I put this presentation together. So maybe that's another talk. Um, but moving on and uh, moving a little more quickly, I think, um, Let's look at my next case story, um, case study at Capital One. Um, this is, so the, the project, the public APIs that Capital One was building when I worked, when I worked there are still alive and kicking. They've gone through, I've kind of watched their progress over the years. And since I left, which is almost four years ago now, um, they've gone through a number of iterations. It's kind of interesting to see though, that in fact, um, some of the issues that we faced initially um, when we were building out the first set of APIs and figuring out a developer portal and figuring out the documentation um, still exist. And they're still, they've been solved in some of the same ways um, with a really nice, sophisticated addition. And here is where I have to tell a story instead of providing a demo, because if I provide the demo, you can't really see very well with the screen share. Um, so apologies for telling instead of showing. You can visit the URL on the slide, however, and see what I'm talking about. Um, so Capital One's developer portal is, is fairly simple and straightforward. If you land on that URL, you get to a fairly high level marketing page, but it's very easy to get into the list of um, detailed um, the list of um, detailed products. 
Um, and there, um, what Capital One has done is a really nice kind of splitting the difference between audiences so that you've got a list of endpoints at the top. So developers know exactly what they're going to be integrating against sort of technically. And then a set of use cases for those business leaders, um, for CTOs and, and PMs who need to decide whether this is, in fact, the right fit. Now, the, the use cases approach is one that we developed when I was there, that adding those endpoints at the top of the page is new. And when I saw it, when I was working on this talk, it made me so happy because it's the coolest thing. You're like really serving both audiences in one quickly and efficiently. Um, now, this works for Capital One partly because it's still a fairly small and relatively simple and straightforward set of APIs. Stripe, not so much. Um, and I'm gonna have to hurry this one up because my clock <laughs> and um, and the conference's talk seem to be a little bit out of sync. That is to say my talk clock. Um, so, um, but what we face at Stripe um, is kind of like the next level of having to address multiple audiences. So we have increasingly, even though Stripe's like core market is still startups um, and it's still the impatient developer who's very code savvy um, and who wants to go in and understand and copy code all at the same time, um, you know, there's more than one type of impatient developers. Some of them know more and they want to understand more. But especially as time to market becomes an increasing pressure on every startup, not just Stripe customers, right? It's like they don't have time, even if they wanted to understand more of what's going on under the hood. What they need is the code to get them started. And increasingly, even less code and less code and less code. So Stripe increasingly offers hosted pages. You don't have to build your own web page to check out, to accept payment. You don't have to build your own web page to let your customers change their subscription terms or their payment method. Stripe will host those forms for you and you can integrate them literally with a line or two, line or two of code. And I'm really not exaggerating because I've written the docs for some of those. Um, at the same time, we provide these long detailed guides um, for folks who do still need the what I'm increasingly thinking of as a kind of older model of documentation. And then because this is this is like the, the last the last bit, <laughs> I promise, Mark. Um, the the thing that's you I think is probably unique almost to, to Stripe, because Stripe docs are so famous. Everybody wants to find everything they want in the docs. People don't go to the marketing pages. So PMs and completely non-technical founders expect to find everything they need in the docs because Stripe docs, they have everything and they're the best, right? <laughs> so we don't really want to send them away to somewhere else, but we also want to make sure we continue to serve those very technical users. This isn't a challenge we've solved. Um, as Patrick Collison likes to say, we haven't won yet, but we're aware of it and working on it. And with that, I... Um, We'll leave my takeaways up just for a minute while Mark intervenes and says, okay, we've run out of time. Thanks, Jennifer. I'm sorry, but we've run out of time. You you uh, set me up really well there. Thank you. Um, th that was a really interesting talk. And uh, thanks for the work that you're doing there at Stripe. Um, you guys uh, uh, do have such a fantastic reputation for your docs. And I appreciate you sharing with us today. Um, if, if you have questions for Jennifer, uh, I'm going to have to ask you to put them in chat because uh, uh, I didn't want to cut off her presentation so that, that we could get um, all of her good points made. Uh, so with that, thank you, Jennifer. And I'm now going to introduce for the second time. Uh, well, first, let me just say this is Mark Quinberry. I'm, um, thank I'm you. <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Um, you can go ahead. And